The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual co-host and do not reflect the official policy or position of the Firearms Radio Network and or their employers. Viewer discretion is advised. This is especially true on our live shows. Broadcast for shooters, hunters, and gun enthusiasts. This is the Firearms Radio Network. The bandwidth for this episode of This Week in Guns is sponsored by Patriot Patch Company. PatriotPatch.co Welcome to This Week in Guns. This show is brought to you by the Firearms Radio Network and Patriot Patch Company. And the show offers commentary on the latest firearms industry news, information, and buzz. I'm your host, Sean Heron, and my panelists this week, uh, both pros, both have been here several times. And first up, he makes videos in his garage. It's Johnny from 180 Second Ideas. What's up, man? I could not be happier being here, Sean. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> so, so good to have you here, man. You're looking slim already, by the way. Uh, let me tell you, I am on day five of, of just not eating garbage. And I feel like a like about I won't say a million dollars, but I feel like about tree fifty. All right, I love it. <laughs> Next up, we got the owner of No Other Choice Firearms Training and the man behind Aiming for the Truth, my friend Kevin Dixie. What's up, buddy? Uh, what's going on, man? How you doing? Uh, doing well, doing well. Johnny, you're my friend too. I don't I don't know why I, why I said it that weird. I, I I feel like I was tingling you out there, and that wasn't my intent. <laughs> He's mad. All right. I am not, I've never been mad in my life. You got this, man. I love you. Love you just the way you are. First up, check out Patriot Patch Company. That's patriotpatch.co. I just got my patch of the month for the for July. And uh, of course, it is fireworks related. I've got several of them. So go check them out if you like that kind of stuff. Uh, first up, Florida, Florida legislators are investigating Marion Hammer for not disclosing money received from the NRA. Uh, so there was these leaks that kind of came out that had a lot of inside data and inside baseball between Ackerman McQueen and the NRA and all kinds of other things. And in, within those leaks, it showed that Marion Hammer had been paid uh, consulting money and lobbying money. And then a bunch of people from the lobbying, uh, what is it, in Florida, the the group that handles lobbying, uh, I'm drawing a blank right now. Oh, yeah. House Public Integrity and Ethics Committee. They said, wait a minute, she hasn't filed any of this with us. So she's getting paid to lobby by the NRA. And even though she's required by the state of Florida to uh, report those funds at the end of every year and not exactly what the funds are, just a range, she has not done it. Johnny, what do you think? I think we are in a season right now with the NRA that is unprecedented. They are the, they've always been a target, but they are the target right now of a lot of leaks and stuff. And I don't know what all is going on. But, and I don't think it's just the left going after them. I think there's a lot of major issues. One major issue is that Marion Hammer. Now, if we have viewers or listeners that have never don't know who Marion Hammer is, she's a muckety muck in the NRA. I don't know what her official title is, but it's, 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 it's up there. And she's been a, a muckety muck there for decades. Yeah. She makes a literal metric fortune from the NRA. It's not a problem. Like it's not a problem. If, if, if you're a decision maker and you're bringing that money in or whatever, that's not the problem. It's not the problem that she's making the money. The real problem what's going on in Florida is that with a separate organization, she did the, the entire lobbying thing that went through when she went up against the Parkland shooters and the Parkland shooters victims and, and that whole, that whole group of survivors. And the problem is that she was getting money from one organization lobbying with a different organization and did not disclose that. I think, you know, for real, Marion Hammer and her cats just need to show up for a meeting. This was the first year that she's been at an NRA meeting, and I think maybe a decade, Sean, somewhere in that window. Yep. But she showed up this year. How about that? That's pretty amazing. Kevin, what do you think? Um, I just think I'm going to I'm gonna really agree with uh, Johnny on a lot he said. I just think, you know, everything's coming out now uh, with the NRA. I know they're having a ton of problems from all different angles. Uh, as far as her not disclosing money, I'm not going to jump too hard on it because was it a technicality or was it malice, right? And I, I don't know. I don't think the story even clarifies that. So if it turns out to be malice, then obviously being dishonest with, with money in those terms is not okay. If it turned out to be a technicality because you forgot to fill out this form and turn it into this pe these people, um, then, I mean, we all make mistakes and you take it for what it is. Uh, so I think now because of everybody's heightened sensitivity to what's going on around the NRA, it made a big story if we didn't have all the backlash over the last year or so, I don't think it would be that big of a deal. But depends. Was it malice or was it a technicality? That's fair. And I think that, yeah, uh, she, by the way, she's a former NRA president and a current and existing board member, as Johnny mentioned there. 
Um, yeah, between 2014 and 2018, she brought in $929,000, so almost a million dollars from the NRA for consulting and lobbying. And uh, yeah, didn't report it to the state. So I, I agree with you, Kevin. I think that had she, you know, had this not all been going on and had we not been mad at her in the first place already for a lot of things that she's done, um, it probably wouldn't even trip the wire. But because everything's kind of sensitive right now, any, any semblance of anything untoward, I think, is uh, being focused on very much. I think one of the important things and you mentioned a moment ago is that, and I always, whenever we talk NRA, I'm always reminding folks, it's not the, it's not just the NRA, it's Ackerman, Ackerman McQueen. They are the driving force behind a lot of this nonsense that's going on. If folks don't know, that is the marketing firm that has been paid gazillions of dollars to, to drive it. And so they're the marketing firm. And that's where a lot of like the stuff going on with Wayne LaPierre, it wasn't that he was taking money from the NRA. He was taking money from Ackerman McQueen who took money from the NRA. So it is a complicated web. I suspect there's a lot more that's going to come out in the, in the coming months and maybe the next year or two, I think it's going to get ugly. Yeah. Sometimes things have to burn down before they can regrow. PA court, uh, PA Supreme court rules stop and frisk is unconstitutional. So uh, this comes to us from ammo land just a couple days ago. And I will say this right here. Um, I don't know, New York city, they have stop and frisk laws where if they suspect, you know, they can stop people and search them and see if they have firearms, weapons, anything like that. Uh, PA put that into, into effect and the firearms policy coalition and fire firearms policy foundation filed a, an amicus brief. Um, and it came came down in the Supreme Court, basically uh, gave a 53-page majority opinion and said, nope, that's not going to work for us. Uh, Kevin, what do you think? Do you think stop and frisk is a good thing? Do you think it's good that the Supreme Court of uh, Pennsylvania struck it down? I think the, the Supreme Court did, a, did, a, did the right thing. I think stop and frisk is the one of the most despicable things that's ever been invented that exists. And I can't believe that anybody would ever click the box to say, yes, this is okay. You are a disgusting human being, right? Somebody should be able to walk down the street. Now you look at it from one aspect of law enforcement. Yeah. We want to make sure that we're, we're, you know, catching the bad guys. Well, guess what? Work, work for it. Like everybody else, you got to work for it. You just can't randomly pull up to people and stop them. And the people that are not offended by stop and frisk aren't the ones getting stopped. You know, they're not, they're not coming to your area, just stopping your, you know, your kids from riding their bikes saying, Hey, let me, let me search you. Let me check you out. Because if they did that in certain communities, it would be an uproar immediately. You stop some high school kid riding his bike or walking home from school in the wrong area. And you're going to have the city council, the local mayor, everybody down your butt, right? You'll lose your job for that. But yet you can go to certain targeted communities and it's like, yeah, we're trying to stop the drugs and things like that. So Anybody you see walking, you can just decide you're going to frisk them. And the problem with that is we lose sight of the communities that they're targeting. Everybody, amp news, let's just say this, news mainstream media always amplifies what's negative and what sells. I think people lose sight of the fact that these areas that are targeted, majority of the people living there are great people, right? They just happen to live amongst some bad people. They get a lot of attention. They do a lot of stuff. So that's the focus. But absolutely not, man. You can't. You can't just, it's not okay. It's not okay to, for somebody to be walking down the street and you randomly stop them and search them. I don't think that that's okay. I don't think that that's ever okay. And I'm happy that uh, the PA Supreme Court did what they did. Yeah, Johnny. I really want to use the word that, that Kevin just said, which is the word random. Like you can't just stop a random person. And this law, to be clear, what they, what they passed today is that or they ruled that it was unconstitutional. It's not that they can't stop people. And it's not that they can't frisk people. They can stop people and they can frisk people all they want. They got to have a reason to do it. And you better be showing a good reason. So yeah, I, you know, I don't want to be hassled. I, I live out in the country. I've got no problem with the high school with half the cops here. And so that's not something we deal with. There's no wall. There's no sidewalks where I live. And, but I, yeah, it's bad. Like it's bad. The whole idea of just the government coming in, and being able to look in my car or look in my person and no, I'm, I'm, I'm like, give a big thumbs up maybe for the first time in my life since the, since the Boston tea party to Pennsylvania, go figure. I like it. Josh Prince uh, finishes this article out by saying he wrote the coalition's brief said that this ruling rightly puts an end to the abusive, non-justifiable searches of law abiding gun owners. And it should be relished by all those who support the fundamental rights enshrined in our constitution. Josh Prince, uh, 
runs Prince Long Consulting, which uh, that is where Adam Kraut also practices law and uh, doing a lot of good there. So congrats to those guys on their success here. Texas rules in favor of self-defense and legalizes brass knuckles. This is one of those kind of weird things. It was put into the same category as knives and guns and every, every other thing. And uh, they have now struck that down. They basically, uh, even more, just a couple of years ago, I think 2013 was the year they said that they took, uh, what is it, switchblades out, out, out of the rules. And now they've taken brass knuckles. Uh, they had anything, any hard material was how their laws was written in Colorado. We can't have metal knuckles of any kind, but you can have all kinds of polymer plastic and everything like that. I think this is a weird, weird law from, from maybe the past. Johnny, what do you think? I, th I think it's a good day in America when people in Texas are now carrying legally brass knuckles. I think that makes Texas better. God bless Texas. God bless their barbecue. God bless the Alamo. We remember it. I think it's a great day. Best news to come out of Texas in forever. Brass knuckles are now legal. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't be happier. Like it's the best news I've had in, in maybe decades. God bless Texas. It's so good. Kevin. Um, first of all, let me say this, um, Johnny. Yes, um, Kevin. You got to have some St. Louis barbecue for you get the praise in Texas. <laughs> all right. Let's just get that out the way. Uh, but to the story, um, congrats, man. I mean, I think it's awesome. I'll tell you what, I'm going to be in Texas uh, a couple, uh, at least once this year in November. And the first thing I'm going to do is when I get off the plane, I'm going to get me some brass knuckles. And I'm going to walk around Texas with some brass knuckles in my pocket, uh, along with my pistol uh, and a knife and a few other things. But that being said, I think that it's awesome. You know, I, I'm not like I never would have like really rode home and fought and, 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 and went, you know, over the edge about brass knuckles. It wouldn't even cross my mind. But every time we get another instrument to keep us safe, I'm always going to celebrate that. So cool. Good with me. Like yeah. It. And I think we come back to the idea of it's not the government's job to decide what's in my pockets or not. Like it's absolutely at this point, like I can't even own a private piece of property, an automobile without going and getting a little piece of paper that says, this is my title. People never even stop and go, I have to have a title to own a house. I have to have a title to own a car. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's the government getting involved in my life. And they want to tell me, here's my other thought. When I was looking at the brass knuckle thing, you got a bunch of, of a bunch of pasty faced politicians in their bloated suits, writing laws like this. And like to save and protect people, you can grab a chair in any place and pull a chair leg off and you could do more damage. Like, like it's a baseball bat than somebody with brass knuckles. Like that's not keeping anybody safe. Let's be real in the real in the street, Brad, that's that law did not help anything. So I don't think it's a banner day for anything. I think it's good when the government ain't in my pockets. I agree. Uh, this next one's tough. Uh, Parkland SRO school resource officer arrested on seven charges for his negligence. Uh, you guys might may remember uh, his name is Scott Peterson. He was the school resource officer outside Parkland that uh, did not enter the school and encouraged other officers not to enter the school as well. Um, until some other until other officers actually showed up and just ignored him and ran in. Uh, he has now been arrested and charged with seven counts of child neglect with great bodily harm, three counts of culpable negligence and exposure to harm, and one count of perjury. He's been arrested. He has a bail of one hundred and two thousand uh, dollars. I have some pretty strong opinions on this, but I want to go with you guys first. Uh, Johnny, I'm going to start with you. I watched the news. I don't watch a lot of news, but I happened to actually watch this yesterday. And I did watch the, I, I've never seen the footage of him hiding out and, and cowering behind the, the facility. I have had a couple points in my life of fight or flight. Uh, I thought at one point, there was a point about a year ago where I was walking in the room and I was almost positive. There was a dead body in there. And I physically started backing up and it was weird because it was that whole, your subcon, whatever it is. I, I, I'm not educated, but all that stuff going on, in your brain that takes over. So I, I'm saying this up front. I understand fight or flight. I understand that. However, this is a true story. I stood down a black bear in Tennessee, stood down. I stood my ground against it. And that was a moment where I had the fight go figure. And Oh my Lord, the adrenaline rush I got from that is second only than to listening to a rage against the machine CD like that. And I said, CD kids, you have to look it up on Wikipedia. So my point is this, I understand the abs absolute, Oh crap. There's a shooter. I know I have a badge, but your brain taking over and running. However, dude, that wasn't some moment, some 
instant instinct. That was, it went on for a while. And then he started instructing other people. Uh, I'm not a person who would ever say, I hope that dude rots in prison. But if I was, I would say, I hope that dude rots in prison. Kevin. Long overdue. All right. So I have a couple of videos out ranting about that, uh, that exact situation when it first happened. And l let me say this. I agree that, you know, no matter how you train or how often you train, certain, there will come a time where you have to you're going to have to either you know, run or fight. It's just what it is. It happens to the best of us. That being said, I'm personally and I could have bias here. I've never backed down from a dangerous confrontation. I never will. It's just what I'm made of and who I am. But I believe once you put on that badge and you 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 swear to protect people, then you have a job to do. But I'm going to get even beyond that, even beyond that. You are a man. OK, and I'll go old school because I have an old soul. It is our job to protect primarily two types of people on this earth, women and kids. Period. Like As a man, forget your position or your title. In that position. A grown man who happened to be armed with body armor and a handgun, he just didn't have a heart or a spine, um, stood outside and listened to the cries and gargles of children and did nothing. How can you allow that to happen? I wouldn't care if it was a, a the, the janitor. And then when you fast forward and when we get more of the details and we're talking about uh, teachers jumping in front of rounds for the kids, uh, other students shielding other children. So the people that were untrained, unarmed, stood up and did more of the manly thing, if you would, and try to protect innocent life. But the grown adult male outside with a gun and a vest decided that he was just going to stand. I mean, really think about that, man. Think about standing outside mere feet from children being slaughtered and you do nothing. And you're armed and trained. It's not like it was me standing out there, you know, slurping on a big gulp from 7-Eleven. It's a dude who is trained. He knows the school. He knows the layout of the school and he's armed and he has actual training. Like it's yeah. not just some random guy out there listening to it. And an SRO, for, for those who don't know, when an SRO is detached from a PD and placed into a school, especially if they're there for a while, a lot of times that those are individuals that are, I mean, it can be a few, but sometimes it is the, you know, it is the guys that are on their way out, right? Kind of take this cakewalk, easy path to retirement, things of that nature. Or sometimes you've been in trouble on the streets and they want to kind of tuck you away. But the thing with the SRO is a great opportunity to build bonds with kids. At the same time, here's something I always said. What did that kid see? I'm not going to say his name. What did that kid see in him over the, you know, over two or three years that told him, I can come do this and that guy's not going to do a damn thing about it? What did he see to say, no, nah, he's not going to fight me back? So I, I would like to say this. If you're not going to defend children and fight for kids like the like the the cop did, I believe that was in Illinois uh, where he stopped it before it started. If you're not going to do that, first of all, take off the badge, but definitely get out of my schools. Get out of the schools. You, you, it's, it's pointless. And I'm glad that they arrested him. I am glad they did. I don't know if they're going to. You might not get a conviction out of this. This could just be for hype and media to appease the people or whatever the case may be. But the fact that he's being arrested for negligence is great, especially when you look at Supreme Court cases uh, that take us back to saying that the police have no responsibility to protect you. I'm glad that this is now happening. Yeah, exactly what you just mentioned. 2005 Castle Rock versus Gonzalez, which is that the police, police departments and law enforcement have no uh, constitutional duty to protect. And so th th this is interesting to me. Look, it's a year later. Right. So it, it's been a year. This has been going on a year. He retired. Now they've arrested him. They've also fired him, which will probably cancel his pension. Um, th this is an awful lot. He is a coward, in my opinion. But it, if you're going to take a year and then do something that really is just symbolic and has no basis in law and he walks away from it at the end. I mean, being a coward isn't a crime. It's despicable, in my opinion. And uh I just, I don't necessarily understand it because clearly the Supreme Court's ruled on this. His defense attorney said that this is spurious charges and immediately asked for them to be dropped. And I probably am going to agree. And again, I think he's a coward. I think he's horrible and he should have done something and he didn't. And he has to live with that for the rest of his life. But if this is a publicity stunt, I, I think that it's uh, misplaced. Any response to that? 
I think for me, and I'm going to go on a left left turn here. Like, like I believe in the system. I really do. I know we have problems, and I know there's problems in America, and there's historical problems. But overall, our system works pretty doggone good. I mean, it's a constitutional republic, the longest it's ever been. I've had a great experience. Yes, I know there's problems. Yes, I get it. But there's a lot more good here than bad. And so my first thought was, okay, the DA would not have proceeded forward with that case without legit solid ev evidence. But then that entire garbage that happened up in Chicago over the last six months with that fake attack and then the, the, the DA there dropping the case, I might be the last, literally the last person in the United States to lose faith in the system. That one, that one really affected me. Like it really, when, when they said they're dropping the case, that one, now they, I know they've reopened it. They've unsealed it, but I, I lost faith and I'm not being dramatic. That was the honest to God's truth. I actually lost faith in the system. So I'm, ha I'm kind of torn. Part of me says the DA wouldn't have pressed charges with his Nimrod if there hadn't have been, you know, legit evidence. 1% of me is I understand maybe the first 12 seconds of his flight, but the rest of it is, dude, that dude needs to be in solitary confinement because the rest of the prisoners in that prison are trying to get him. I know that's harsh. I'm sorry. No, you're right. Kevin, any last words on this? Uh, yeah. Well, to just address Johnny, um, most of the, the, the department agencies around the country will uh, ISO any uh, former law enforcement. So if he's insane, they'll be ISO protective custody or PC or whatever uh, confinement tanks they have or, or better cell blocks they have with good behavior to keep them safe. Uh, but the um, I'm, I'm, I'm not OK if we are using taxpayers money for a publicity stunt. That's why I said if it's just a stunt, then I don't I don't I don't agree with that either. But I do like the fact that he got charged, not simply because he wasn't effective, but you just stood there and let it happen, right? I would have felt better if you at least ran in the building and grabbed kids that you did see and made sure they didn't get toward the gunfire, shielded them in a room and kept them safe. But you stood outside and hung out at your golf court, man. Just not okay. But I'm also not okay with somebody just doing something to make you happy knowing it's not going to be effective. So don't waste the taxpayer's money down in Florida uh, in that county, wasting our money, taking this guy to court when you know you don't have anything to stick to him or anything won't stick just because you want to shut him up. So I can see both sides of that, but ultimately I'm glad that there is a penalty for him, even if it is just embarrassment. Yeah, I can definitely agree with you there. I'm going to go off script, guys. I'm going to mention a news story that's not in the notes here. Uh, and the reason why is because it directly relates to Kevin Dixie and No Other Choice Firearms Training, which is where I spent uh, some time very, very recently at the Train and Learn event. Now, Kevin, at that event, which was an awesome event, by the way, I'm really glad I went, got a lot out of it. Uh, but there was a, a young man there named Mike, and uh, you know, we trained with him. I talked to him a lot. We, I got to hang out with him a lot the entire weekend. It was really cool. He's a good dude. Uh, Kevin, can you tell us kind of what happened to Mike after he went back to uh, when he went back home after the event? Yeah, so um, at the Train and Learn event, uh, not only myself, but the two instructors that he spent the most the most time with was uh, Ken Scott with Perfectus Group, uh, Dustin Pluth um, with Team Springfield and Under Industries, and a little time with Karen Moser, and then obviously some time with me. Um, but the important part about that was we had, and, and the point is you never know what you're going to do. Now, the Train and Learn event was much more than just gun training. We were, we were learning business and um and things, how to be a better two-way advocate and all sorts of things, really getting into the classroom and figuring out how to be better at this thing you do. But part of it was gun training. He had never been to any professional training, right? Um, can build guns, a very smart kid, uh, but never been to any professional training. Well, that weekend was the first time he actually got exposed to training. And he left, you know, Sunday night around 1130 after a few of us all had dinner. After the event was over, we all sat, we had dinner, uh, broke some bread together and everybody went home. Not 12 to 13 hours later, he went uh, home, uh, had his five-year-old son, all right, and went to empty some trash. And while emptying trash, he um, came into contact with a very angry, upset uh, young man who didn't mind brandishing what gang he was a part of and the fact that he was going to hurt somebody, decided to direct that anger toward Mike. Um, and it led to him uh, flourishing a gun and taking a shot at Mike with that gun. Mike then immediately used the training. And this is his words. He credited credits, credit, gives credit back to the training uh, to where immediately uh, a few things happened. One, 
uh, there was a, a very passionate moment during that training where I kind of jumped down um, uh, real hard on making sure that we understand that when it comes to children, because children want the, 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 the topic, when it comes to kids, we fight, period. There is no backing down. Male, female, we train the same, we fight the same. A parent is a parent just for that moment in conversation. And he said, yeah, I remember that, you know, like, yeah, you know, like you got to be willing to fight. And then there was um, his training, obviously, that he got from uh, primarily Ken, Dustin, Karan, and then myself. And he drew his firearm and he executed shots on target. And it wound up with the individual getting shot in the head, um, I believe, a couple of times. He was brain dead for a few days. Now he's deceased. Uh, but in the and although that is tragic of what happened, it goes to talk about the importance of training. We don't just train. I don't do training videos a lot online because I'm not on on social media and things for the glitz and glamour of showing you how cool I can be. I get with trainers and myself that are serious about teaching people skills to protect their lives, not about being Instagram famous. So um, we were able to execute and do that uh, primarily. And I give most credit to uh, both Ken Scott and Dustin Pluth. Uh, but he was able to execute those shots. And um, me and him have talked a lot. Uh, we talked well before then. And we're, we've obviously been in contact a lot after that. Uh, but it goes to the importance of training, man. Um, I'm glad that there was a situation he could learn and use those skills. He hadn't even taken a shower since the training class yet. He hadn't even got a chance to shower yet. And he had to use those skills. So take your training serious um, because that is the, the prime example. And look, man, I've had not only did that happen to him, in the last 30 to 40 days, I've had three students use their guns in self-defense. Um, two of them resorted to people being, uh, I'm sorry, two of them resorted in death and one of them resorted in uh, hospitalization in three different states around this country. So take your training serious. And that situation with Mike, it wasn't even a half a day later. He hadn't even got a chance to shower from being sweaty on the range. And the next thing you know, he had to defend his life. So. Take it serious, man. Um, don't get caught up in a hoopla or uh, being intimidated about what you see. And that happens with a lot of people because we have so many tactical operators and guys that know what they're doing. Don't get me wrong. But a lot of their training can look really intimidating and it creates a falsehood about what you really might go through. The chances of you you having to use your gun against a threat in your your own neighborhood um, or coming out of a store is going to be significantly heavier than you ever putting on a plate carrier rolling across a Buick. Yeah. It just really is. Right. So, um, yeah, that's what happened, man. So the story, I, the thing I get from that is take your training serious. Uh, don't take it lightly. Um, no matter who you go to, uh, he just happened to come to an event that I was hosting and it worked out. Uh, but it goes to show, man, look how quick that can happen. Yeah, for sure. Johnny, uh, what are your thoughts on this whole thing? That's the first I've heard this. I didn't know any about that. I am as a dad, I am very thankful that Mike got home to his family. After the event, not after the, uh, well, yes, after the firearms event, but after the event in the street, trying to take your garbage, you trying to take your garbage out and have to deal with nonsense. Uh, the world, the world's dark in the movie Hellboy. They said there's things that go bump in the night and we're the ones that go that bump back. And somebody's got to, I was talking to, and here's just me. I'm always open and honest with people. I have no idea what I'm doing. Like, like here's where I'm at with my firearms. When I'm with my friends, my local friends, I'm by far the best. And when I'm with all you guys, I'm by far the worst. I'm right. I feel like right in between professionals and amateurs. And I am right now going through some steps in my life to get ready to train this fall. And I'm serious about it. And at 45 years old, I think it's important. Um, I'm glad Mike got home. Yeah, me too. He's a good dude. Uh, if you would like to hear more about this story, you can find it at We Like Shooting uh, from the Firearms Radio Network. That is at welikeshooting.com slash show. There's an entire uh, hour and 15 minute episode where we talk to Mike. We talk to Mike about the physiological responses to uh, the situation, kind of what happened. We walk through the through it second by second. And then we talk about the aftermath and what he has gone through since then. Uh, it looks like everything is going to work out. Everything's going to be okay. But sometimes, sometimes we get lucky. Sometimes we don't. Check out Second Call Defense as well. That's firearmsradio.tv slash SCD. Uh, but thanks to Kevin, especially for for uh, pushing Mike to let us tell his story uh, because, you know, we we do care about him and we wanted to make sure that he was going to be all right. So thank you, Kevin. And uh, it was a good, good discussion here, guys. Thanks. No problem. All right. Next story. Uh, pretty depressing one. At least 12 dead after disgruntled employee opens fire at a Virginia Beach Municipal Center. Um, this is going to drive a lot of the conversation for the rest of the show, actually. 
Uh, it was a guy, he got into a violent altercation at work. He knew he was going to be disciplined for it. He went in this morning, uh, that morning and put in his resignation. And that afternoon he walked back into that place with a firearm and he just started shooting indiscriminately at, uh, anyone that he saw pretty much didn't appear to be specifically targeted from anything that I've read. Um, it's tough. Uh, it has been reported that he had some high capacity magazines and I don't mean 15 rounds. It, it look, it seems like extended magazines from what I've read. It seems as if he had a silencer or suppressor uh, from what I've read. And a lot of the anti-gun media has jumped on this as being a huge problem. Uh, first off, this is terrible. Uh, you know, my heart goes out to anyone who is affected by this in any way, shape or firm, form. We talk about these kind of things when they happen. Uh, we never say the killer's name on this show. And I, I think that a lot of uh, news agencies are starting to adopt that. But clearly the big ones like CNN, MSNBC, things like that, they're, they're, they're talk, talking about them and glorifying them in a way, I think. But this is a tough one. Johnny, start us off. What, what are your thoughts here? There's a lot to unpack. I think it's unfortunate in situations like that, that we immediately make it about ourselves. We all do it. I called dad today and I said, dad, I am worried about Trump and the suppressor thing. And so I think I may go ahead and get a couple stamps. Um, I've got one sitting there waiting, but a couple more stamps and form fours ready to go. And I stopped tonight getting ready for the show. And I thought, why am I making this about me? Like, they, like there's people, like there's parents who are not going to go on, uh, you know, on vacation with their kids this, this summer. Like there's legit families in turmoil that lives are changed. Kids are changed. Parents are changed. And so I think there's a lot going on. And I think the other thing that strikes me is my Lord, these are happening nonstop, like absolutely nonstop. These, these things, just one after another. And I'm getting jaded. Like I'm almost to the point where I, okay, there's another shooting. All right. There's another shooting. And finally, there are going to be people who are not going to let the crisis pass without politicizing it. And yes, I know it's a political conversation, but holy cow, what a mess we're in. So I'm trying not to make it just about me, but there are some personal responses I do have. Kevin. Well, I'm, I'm, I always get conflicted, man, because I, I, I have a, a problem where I, I take on people's problems and their, their, their feelings. And only thing I can think about is, you know, what if that was one of my family members that didn't make it home from work, right? Um, so I know people say they want more than thoughts and prayers, but literally you freeze up. There's, I, I have nothing else to offer, uh, besides the thought that every time something happens, I really wish that I was the guy there to fight back. I just do because it's, it's good versus evil. And I want to be on the side of the good people and, uh, help eliminate evil. Um, but after that, I do think that it's, it's tragic, uh, that that individual would, you know, do what he did. I think that when people immediately, uh, mainly politicians or people that feel one way about the issue of firearms decide to immediately start using that blood as lubricant to start greasing the wheels to, to get more gun control. I think that's when we lose sight of humanity. Um, we lose sight of what we are. You're, you're literally using the trauma and tragedy of somebody's life to get your own personal agenda across. And I, I think that that's horrible if either side is using it. Um, but I think that when we look at these, these incidents that are happening, um, they're going to be unavoidable. You know, we, we couldn't, we, we couldn't stop this guy who, even if they had security, probably could have gotten the building anyway, if he worked there, um, and doing this thing. And we couldn't stop Timothy McVeigh from backing up a truck full of feces, right? Like crime is going to be crime. And I, I, only thing I can do is just hope that somehow the good people in this world realize that it's really good versus evil. And that's what we should be eliminating and not using the tragedy and the loss and the blood of individuals to push political agendas. Yeah. So the result of this already is this is reported by Bloomberg, clearly uh, anti-gun president. Donald Trump said he'll seriously look at banning gun silencers after last week's mass shooting in Virginia. Well, I'd like to think about it. He said, I'm going to seriously look at it. He said, when did we get to a point in this country where one event one thing regardless of how terrible it is suddenly is is resulting in the outlawing of things that have been used millions and millions and millions of times without incident um do we hear of any other crimes being committed with silencers or suppressors no i really don't i i haven't heard of one in quite a while and i do this show every single week i've done the show every single week for a year and a half 
and I don't recall hearing another story or another story making the news where this happened. One man uses bump stocks for evil in Las Vegas and suddenly bump stocks are, are gone and gone without the, um, without the, the, the system that, that we need so much to work exactly like that. Uh, he did something illegal. He used one thing. I mean, if we started to ban cars because people dr- drove drunk, it, it, that's how it feels to me. I don't know if maybe I'm just oversimplifying that. And now one man uses a silencer in a crime, a heinous crime, clearly. But now we're talking about getting rid of this. We saw Christchurch, New Zealand. Um, they changed the entire country. And I have said this multiple times that they gave that man more power than anyone else in that entire country had. Um, are we at that? How do we get to this point? John, I'll start with you. Like, what are your thoughts on, on that line of thinking? As you know, Sean, I, I do own a literal, t- I have a tinfoil hat right up there. I mean, I literally own a tinfoil hat that I will put on whenever I talk conspiracies. But I mean, I really honestly, deeply believe, and I'm not an alarmist. I'm, I'm level headed to some degree. I believe they want our guns. Not everybody, not every Democrat's coming after our guns. By God, the government ain't trying to come after guns. But there is a contingency that needs to disarm the populace in order to spread communism and or socialism. I know they're wrapped together. But I really do believe that this is a very serious problem. There is a larger agenda going on than just simple laws. I think it's a it's a major problem. And I, I don't think I've ever said that publicly on media. I think one of the challenges is that, you know, because right now we're creating a show. Like right now we're on, on This Week in Guns, and we have listeners. And good shows require differences of opinions. Like if you're watching uh, an ESPN show and somebody says, hey, the Eagles are going to win, the other host has to say, no, the Cowboys are going to win. You've got to go up against each other. And though it may not be all that interesting, I think all three of us are, and and probably everybody listening, are on the exact same page that this is a fight that we are in that goes bigger than this week's issues and bigger than this one shooting situation. Though it's tragic, we're in a pickle right now. Kevin, um, yeah, it's to me, it's it's a couple of a couple of different problems. Uh, one, I agree with your original statement. You know, why do we allow one thing to happen and then we just go we go ban crazy, right? But I think the answer to that is, um, I don't. I, I have a hashtag where I say I don't do politics, right? I do policy, people, and I just talk the truth. Uh, that's kind of what we get uh, as a collective. The people that are both, if you're both pro gun and pro Trump, that's what you get. Because I've constantly told people, you don't trust anybody in politics. And when people were kept saying, well, oh, he's a businessman. Okay. How many multimillionaire businessmen have you met that aren't politicians? All right. You get to that certain level of money, you are politicking uh, to the best of them. So what I believe is that there comes a time when he needs to make some moves and we're the sacrifice. Right. So it's. And I think America got caught off guard and wasn't prepared because, you know, you hear things like the eight year assault on your Second Amendment rights is over. You 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 know, you see Donald Jr., you know, is obviously very pro gun. You know, I've met him and spoke to him and I believe that he is true and true, very pro gun. Uh, However, at the same time, we let we the people let our guards down. And I think we get separated from remembering that it really is we the people. And we weren't guarded enough about one of the things we hold true. And that's you know, our, our right to be protected and our right to protect ourselves. So shame on us in a way uh, for letting our guards down and just trusting a politician to have our backs um, because we're a bargaining chip. And I think that we need to get back to understanding that we, the people need to keep our rights safe. And we forget the politicians work for us and we never fire them. We, we never do. We never fire them. We never have, have a fit because we just want to hold on to who we morally think we align with. Uh, but I, I don't know. I mean, a lot of people get crazy about politics and they they worship people. And I just don't. Uh, I'm like, what are you doing? And when she start attacking, we the people, because where he's sitting at, it won't affect him not having suppressors or not having bump stock or not having a, a 15 round capacity magazine or even Virginia's calling for a magazine ban less than 10. Now, that might not affect him, but that affects us. Right. So we should be united to make sure that we can keep our rights. Um I think that the overall look of government, 
come in and take our guns to Johnny's point, I believe there is a very, very potent part of government that does not want people to be armed. And I believe that it does not have a political party alliance. I believe it's across both across the aisle on both sides. And I believe that they won't openly come say it, um, even though they have slipped up in the last couple of years and really let some stuff come out of their mouths. They won't openly blatantly say it consistently because then uh, once you put all your cards on the table, you're easy to fight. But we got to wake up and be smarter, man, because we are allowing, allowing people to tell us because they like the same jelly beans we like that we just throw all our trust in them. And then on the, the back end, they erode our rights away. And because it feels good and they use lubrication, we say it's OK. Yeah, I agree. All this right before uh, a petition gets to the Supreme Court where they decide whether to hear a case about a disabled U.S. Army veteran and a Kansas native who basically just went to a military sur surplus store and bought a silencer directly off the shelf because they are not uh, illegal or NFA items in Kansas by Kansas state law. And this is a, a big thing, you know, federal and state laws in which supersedes which he was arrested and this, he has petitioned the Supreme court to hear his case because he lost on that in, in the lower courts. Um, this is an interesting one. It's very interesting that right before this one goes, you know, I'm not a tinfoil hat guy, but uh, interesting timing. And maybe, maybe there's just always cases going on that, that different things will come up. But yeah, this, this petition goes there and his petition, uh, Eric Pratt from Gunners of America said that his petition presents solid, well-argued questions important to all gun owners. And they hope the court will grant certiori to decide them. Uh, they will issue a decision on June 6th, which is tomorrow from when we were recording this. Um, and yeah, I don't, I, I don't know how that's going to go. Uh, generally, if they decide to take one, it's because they plan to overturn the lower court is uh, what I've been, uh, what has been bashed into my head by Ryan Kleckner. So maybe, maybe not. We will see, and hopefully we'll be able to report back to, on that next week to you guys. There's, um, we all, we all know, and this is so preaching to the choir and just uh, speaking in an echo chamber, but we know that evil can't be legislated away. Australian shooter used an illegal shotgun to kill four, two dead, 16 injured in a Japan stabbing attack. Uh, the mode and method of injury is not the important part here. The mode and method is the madness behind the person wielding the, the weapon. And I honestly think that the Australian thing, I uh, was just a guy well-known to police had a tracking bracelet on his ankle, uh, went around, just killed, killed four people with a shotgun, an illegal shotgun in, in Australia. I think that this will further take away gun rights in Australia. I think one person doing one thing will do that. Uh, we already know that, uh, in England and Britain, it's incredibly difficult to get anything, uh, a knife, uh, carrying a screwdriver is illegal. And that is the slippery, slippery slope that we, that we too will go down if, if things don't change. Um, Johnny thoughts on thoughts on Australia and Japan. I don't mean this to sound harsh, but I don't care what happens overseas. Uh, I care if they try to bring it in and affect our laws. Uh, I'm not, a, I'm, I'm a dad. It's not, I'm not that I don't care about people. I don't, don't mishear me, but I don't give a rat's rear end what happens overseas like this. We have enough problems right here. Uh, I care about human life. Like don't chase it too far. But yeah, it's an absolute mess. Like you can't even carry a butter knife in London right now. Like literally cannot carry a butter knife. So do I want to see that crap come here? Uh, no people, you know, and they always like in the comment section, they're always saying repeal the NFA. We are so far away from talking about repealing the NFA. Also to your point about the, the thing that's going before the Supreme court tomorrow. And like uh, it's, I. Uh, I'm not going to say it out loud. I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to put on my tinfoil hat, but there are powers that are more, more influential than Sean, Kevin, and Johnny mm. that have a say so in what's going on and, and the timing of things. And so there's a lot of things I ain't going to say out loud uh, that would really start with, I'm not even going to say it. Like there's like the timing's just too, too funky and too often, you know, uh, one thing happens. It's a coincidence. Two things happens. Oh, that's weird. Three things happen. And boy, that's, it's a little bit more than a coincidence, I think. And it's just, we kind of see that going on and on. Kevin? You know, I, I, I do think that they need to, to shore up their laws over there. I think that those, those humans do have a right to be armed. But you know, one, one thing I got asked uh, about a year and a half, maybe two years ago, is I was having a, I was having a conversation uh, with a Japanese American who was going back home and he set me down and asked me a very, very serious question. He's like, 
he was going. He's like, if I get an audience, which I believe he was going to have with um, some of the political heads over there, he said, but if I get an audience with the emperor, can you give me some tips on how to address the firearms issue with him? Because people in Japan actually do want to defend themselves. Um, and we had that conversation, a nice long conversation as well. And I just hope that that's that we get more of that. I hope we get more uh, people of foreign descent or immigrants or people that have ties to other lands that actually ask us what they can do to go back and share information to strengthen their rights. And then that helps out with what Johnny's concern was, which is mine too. Don't let's keep it over there and seal it off and get you guys sure it up so you don't bring it over here. Um, because you know, walking down, I never forget when I when I saw that on the. Um, on the news or I saw the picture of it, I thought that was a joke in London. I thought somebody made a funny meme with the knife collection boxes. I really thought that was a meme at first, right? It's not. And, <laughs> it's really <laughs> not. Um, and you read more into it and it's like, okay, you, you go from guns and then you go from knives, you go for knives and to Johnny's point, you can't carry around any kind of dinner knife or anything like that. Um, so I think that when it comes to, a, to America, um, we just have to keep educating people. And I think that's, some of the, the what we lose when we scream a lot is we forget that we actually have an education we can share with people. So yeah, guess what? You got criminals running around with with uh, ankle braces on that can murder four people, and I'm pretty sure he wanted the number to be a lot higher than that with a shotgun. Well, we got people around here too doing the same thing. Wouldn't you like to be able to defend yourself and fight back and just really have some of those those really really intricate conversations with people? But um, I just hope they learn from us and we can educate them, man, to keep keep stuff sealed off because. I tell you what, we are in a bad place. If you fast forward even 10, 15 years where you can't defend yourself, can you imagine, ima imagine what the criminal element is going to do? Yeah. I think we need to focus on what's really important in this conversation is, is who carries around a butter knife to begin with? Like, I don't understand <laughs> how you end up with a butter knife in a pocket. Like, think about your life. Like we have probably <laughs> between the three of us over a hundred years of life experience. I can never, I don't think I've ever seen it. There's a, that's a big knife. Yeah. That not, I understand. Not, not a butter knife. I don't understand. How do you get a butter knife in your pocket? Like I've never seen a butter knife in a pocket of any sort, a drawer on a table in the dishwasher that like, that's it. Like the, the movement of a butter knife through its life cycle is, is pretty limited and confined. How did that happen in London? That is, that's what's important. <laughs> and who is enough of a badass that they're like, you know what? If anyone messes with me, I'm going to cut them with a butter knife. I'm going I'm to butter that toast if you know what I mean. Exactly. Like, what was this person planning? I I, I can't come up with anything other than probably like, brunch is what yeah. he was planning. <laughs> that was silly. Uh, right. I do want to point out Sean did pull a knife on somebody at the, the recent event, but it was, now. it was Dustin Pluth. He. <laughs> <laughs> but it was awesome though right it was awesome it was pretty impressive i did a shoulder roll and came up with a knife it was uh, pretty impressive when i hear someone rushing me from behind i go into that fight mode and that's what happens just for everyone out there i want you all to hear it right now don't just don't do it it's not it was good though yeah. um this is this is a depressing show there's a lot of bad news so let's move into something really uh, really positive here new york man faces charges for killing two intruders because he didn't have a gun permit so old man, 60 plus years old is in his house. People break in. He sees them coming right down the hallway towards them. He opens fire with the gun and uh, kills them both. The cops come out, come out there and they say, well, you don't have a gun permit. And he says, well, I inherited the gun from my dad. And they say, well, you don't have a gun permit. So you're not allowed to, to actually own these. And uh, you know what? You're under arrest. We're, we're going to charge you. Uh, Kevin. <laughs> New York. All right. <laughs> oh, man. So let me see. You put me in a situation to where. I am either going to, yes, it's really, you know, be um, judged by 12 or carried by six. It really is that, that kind of situation. In New York, show, show everybody uh, through that case and the case a few years back where the guy picked up the, was it a crowbar or something? And he beat the guy that he caught raping his wife. Same situation. Basically, they want you to where you are not defending yourself. You allow crime to rule and hope that the police catch up with the bad guy eventually. Right. Um, and I think that New York is just showing her hand with that for you to. And then look at look at the I get the laws a lot. Don't get me wrong. We're talking about a man that lived over 60 years on this earth. Somebody comes in his house, he defends himself. You think you even keep that under wraps like, look, pop, we're not going to make this public. 
Okay, you did the right thing. We're going to wash this away. But FYI, if you're going to, we're going to take this. If you need another one, this is the steps for you to go through. Like, where is the decency and where where is the the assistance in that? But no, we're so headstrong on getting, proving that we are not going to take this gun crap from nobody. It's New York. And we're going to arrest a 60-something-year-old man for defending himself in his home during a home invasion. Instead of saying, hey, we're going to take this, but this is the way you can do it right. I, I, I They suck. Johnny, where's the decency? I think the decency is that Ronald, 64 years old, is still alive today. He is still sucking air here on planet Earth. Here's what's fascinating to me. Like, like sometimes whenever I'm with, because uh, there's things that I that I do teach, not, not cool stuff like Kevin does. But when I'm teaching my classes, sometimes we talk about, and I do, I do, uh, I like talking about what we think. And I always say this, I love asking people, when you hear a bump or a creak in the night, Who's in your house? Like we all have this person that's in our house. Mine's always this like skinny white tatted up meth head. And he's like, he's wearing a toboggan, but the toboggan's like, like kind of roll. It's like what one, one roll around. Like he's loading boxes in a 1964 steamship. <laughs> Nobody ever thinks there's a woman break. It's always like a good guy with a gun beats a bad guy with a gun. Nobody ever says a bad woman with a gun. Here's what's fascinating is the pair that, that have now gone, gone to be with Jesus that old Ronald up in New York popped was a woman named Patricia and her nephew. What kind of a butter knife carrying duo is yeah. some, is Nicholas and his aunt. Like you get with your aunt. What kind of family are you in? You get with your aunt and say, let's go burglarize some homes. Don't think my aunt brings me is jello salad. I, I was kind of <laughs> wondering if they were just, they, they'd finished like breaking bad and the game of Thrones. And then they were just bored. So they're like, Jesse, you know what? Yeah, let's Jesse, go we need it. to burglarize. <laughs> Uh, for the record, that, that whole knife story uh, from Missouri, it was all a joke. It wasn't real. I wasn't actually going to stab anybody. I don't think anybody's concerned at all about that. Sean. <laughs> no, I didn't see. Look, I'm look, you, where I come from, we just walk away. <laughs> so. um, Pete Brownell resigned from the NRA board. Uh, and I also will say that when the. Uh, uh, how do I want to describe this? There was a letter that came out from the president and Carolyn Meadows. And uh, the first VP and the second VP, the cookie man. And it was signed by a bunch of past presidents saying, hey, everything's fine. Everyone working against us. This is all Bloomberg and, and whatnot. Uh, there was a previous president, a couple actually, Oliver North, clearly, because, you know, they're all mad at him. But uh, P. Brownell did not sign that letter as well. And then about a week later after that letter came out, he resigned as a uh, board of director member. Johnny? Uh, do you have your hat handy? What do you think about this? I I don't give a rat's rear end at this point what goes on with the NRA. Um, I'm a member and I'll be there next year. Like we need it. But there's 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 stuff going on for for the board to call for the resignation of Wayne Lapierre, call for his resignation, and then the next day unanimously vote him in now i ain't buying an ackerman mcqueen they got a fancy name but i wasn't born yesterday there's more crap going on here i love brownells um you know and i've i've met and talked to pete brownell so you know it's i i think he's a good guy i trust what he says but i think i think it smells like duty and i think there's a lot of stink going on yeah yeah i like pete i think he's uh, got amazing character as well and um yeah, it, it says a lot to me. Um, Kevin, now, did you see that that I said that I've talked to Pete? And that's all I got. Like, like Kevin's talked to to Donald Trump Jr., but that's right. the only name I have to drop. I know Sean, and I've met Pete. That's all I got. <laughs> I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure Junior doesn't remember me. It was it was a short conversation, but I do and have had several conversations at length with Pete. Um, <laughs> um, Pete is an awesome individual. I really I really like that man. Um, He's a good guy, very humble for as successful as his family is. And, and he is as an individual, very humble, uh, good person. Him resigning, um, I'm going to be honest with you. It it kind of took me by shock only because in my, in my own ignorance, I thought when he stepped down from president, he did resign from the board. I, I thought he was already gone. Um, that was just me making assumptions. I had no proof. I just figured he stepped down and walked away. Um, so the fact that he still hung on and was on the board showed me just the kind of resolve he really wanted to, he really had in trying to help the situation. Um, I, I would just say this. Um, 
I know I know several members of the board. I know several people that are fighting for good. Um, I've had a lot, a lot of in-depth conversations, and I'm not going to pretend to be Pete's best friend, but from the conversations I've had with him, um, I believe he did what he thought was morally right for him. Was yeah. it was it his choice to step down? Because we're we're assuming at this point, I don't believe any publication or any press release from Ackerman and McQueen. We keep saying that he stepped down. Did he really step down? I mean, that's what it said. It said that uh, Brownells is going through a lot of uh, growth and has a lot of initiatives, and he needs to really um, so here's focus the, on his family. Kind yeah, of deal. Give, give retiring from politics. Yeah, full time attention that will be needed as our brands continue to grow. I've decided to step down from my position on NRA's board of directors. And look, I'm not saying one thing or the other. Maybe that, maybe that's totally it. Maybe it's not totally it. I'm just saying wasn't wasn't on that letter. Now he's resigning from the board. I'm not. I'm not offering any. Uh, any. And to, to be clear, I'm not saying that I don't believe Pete. I believe Pete. He's a man of character. Yeah. I'm saying I don't trust Ackerman McQueen press releases. Yeah, I agree, especially on Amo Land. Um, <laughs> let's go ahead and move into. I'm offended. Salesforce puts the screws to gun sellers. This is kind of an interesting one. You probably haven't heard of Salesforce unless you're in the IT industry in some way. Salesforce is a big CRM or a content relation management software that they use for a, a ton of different things. And really the implementations of those are, are huge. And this is kind of an interesting one because we've seen a lot of stuff happening on the front end and with banking and things like that operation choke point. I can't remember another one like this. That's a very, very behind the scenes kind of type th software uh, that is used, inter used enterprise wide. Uh, suddenly said that, hey, if you make uh, the ban is anyone who sells automatic and semi-automatic weapons, 3D printed guns, and number of accessories such as magazines capable of accepting more than 10 rounds and flash or sound suppressors, you need to find something else. And when when you say find something else, that's not just installing a new program on your computer. These these people are paying millions of dollars in licensing costs and many more millions in infrastructure and support and of these systems that are running the Salesforce software. So this is not just go out there uh, and, and just do something really quick. This is a big, huge enterprise wide change. And man, I'm, I'm actually surprised. Kevin, did you hear about this? What are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I did. And, and it, to your point, I didn't know who they were. I actually had to look it up. I'm like, who are these guys that are taking this stance? Um, I just think that when, when it comes to that, I don't know why people, why, why do we live in a world where you have to have an opinion? Why? There are plenty of things people ask me. I'm like, dude, I, I just, I just don't, I don't care. Like what, what ruffled you that bad to where you say, you know what? 99.9% .9 of the population doesn't even know we exist. They don't know, even if they use our stuff, they don't know who we are. So why did you feel you had to take a stand? Now that could be anything. It could be political pressure. It could be financial pressure. It could be a lot of things. Um, but for you to even go down to the point where you're saying, yeah, not only are we, we not want to do business with someone who sells these things, but then you start putting round counts on the magazines. Which means somebody wrote that for you, right? You're getting you're getting pushed from some some way somehow, um, and I just think it's pathetic. I think that nobody knows who you are. You didn't have to toss any of your weight into this into this hat, and I think that it's 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 stupid. And how far do we go? Because right now it's guns, and everybody's like, oh well, guns are so polarizing. At least, but what happens when somebody doesn't doesn't believe in your sexuality and they say well we're not going to support this or you voted a certain way so we're going to pull these things from you and not offer our services or because you are too loud with your opinion about various topics and we disagree with you we're not going to pull our support and services like when does this stop so that, that's that's how i feel about it johnny scary thing is this in the 40s it was thrown out to the masses that carrots make our eyes really, really good. And that was literally propaganda. And you can go into any first grade classroom today, a long time later, at least 10 years later since World War II, and ask those kids, hey, what happens if you eat carrots? And there will be kids in every single first grade classroom in America that will say, oh, it makes your eyesight better. If you say things enough, it becomes real. Perception is reality. And this thing, what scares me most about this, in that paragraph, assault weapons, fully automatic, and 10-round magazines. Yes. And I'm hearing that word, 10-round magazines, 10-round magazines, 10-round magazines. And I think I, it scares me. I think it may be coming where that is going to be the new, like if you say it over and over and over, because we're always shifting things. Oh, well, we don't care about bump stocks. 
as long as we keep this or we don't care about that. And I'm afraid that is going to be the line that's drawn in the sand is they're going to want to, they're going to want 10 round magazines and that would blow. That's bad. You know, you know what the problem with that is, though, and, and this is something I think uh, industry wide we've missed. That's one of the kinks in our armor, though. So think about it. 20 and 30 rounders are too much for them, right? Because like, oh, the amount of the, we're losing lives and we just have to save one life. We can save one life. This will work, right? For the kids. Yeah. So you only care about 10 kids. 11 is just 11 is too much. Now you can have the 10 of them. 11, you're crossing the line here. So that, that goes to show that you aren't really concerned about the capacity of a thing. You're just dwindling down the rights to have it all together. And that's yeah. what they're doing. And they're just sales force people that are just helping along with that. Yep. hundred percent. All right. Uh, I don't know that there's any good news even in the show on, uh, even in, even in the full auto news segment, uh, the only one that I saw that I was like, oh, that's that's weird is Florida man arrested for killing woman during foreplay. And Kevin, you just talked about kinks in the armor. This is kinks in the bedroom. Uh, yeah, I cannot personally figure. <laughs> not bad, Sean. Not bad. Like, like you've done better, but that that was not bad. Not a bad segue. Thank you. I what were they doing? Uh, she was shot in the upper body with his legally owned handgun around 1230 p.m. on a Sunday. And. Not only is this weird and who uses guns for foreplay, but who's having sex at 1230 in the afternoon? I I, I want to know that. Sky rockets in flight. Oh, yeah. That's all good. That's afternoon good. delight. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. I don't know exactly what kind of foreplay they were involved in. Um, you guys ever engage in that at all? Hmm. <laughs> Just silence. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I happen to have my my beautiful seven year old child sitting about three feet from me, so I'll just uh, I'll behave. Uh, Johnny. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will. I will say this though. He should have really paid attention to all the um, uh, the safety rules. If he would have listened, just known the safety rules, they could have had a great time. Wouldn't have been a problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I was also surprised when I found out she was shot in the chest and I don't know. Anyway, that, that that's going to do it right there. But before we go, before we do anything else, I want to hear about you guys, what you've been up to and where people can keep up with you and follow all the, all of your misadventures. Uh, Johnny, start us off. Uh, most of my stuff is at 182nd ideas over on YouTube. And a lot of folks, we do a lot of, a lot of folks know that we do a lot of high drinks over there. And so this summer I'm doing a ton of fun stuff. I have an alternate character that I play, and uh, he's a redneck from Appalachia, and he is going on a lot of adventures. Up next is I got a brand right over there, a brand spanking new pistol caliber carbine from High Point that they sent me <laughs> in chambered. And if I gave you five guesses, you couldn't do it. It's chambered in 380. And I think I'm going to saw the uh, the front post off of it and just get the barrel the barrel all nice and smooth and stack donuts on it and go to the range and turn that 380 pistol caliber carbine into a donut warmer. Finally, here's my question because I know Patriot Patch is our is our uh, sponsor here. Yes, sir. I got the patch of the month yesterday, and I know people listening can't see it, but it's a whole bunch of fireworks. But one of the fireworks is a tennis ball. Tennis ball. It's a tennis ball with a cannon, a lit fuse, a big cannon fuse coming out of it. Uh, somebody's, now, I am from a, a place in this world that knows fireworks. If anybody knows bygone fireworks, it's Appalachia. And they stumped me. I don't know what kind of Yankee company this is bringing down tennis balls. So, so can one of y'all educate me? Why is a tennis ball lit with a fuse? I got nothing. I've never seen this before in my life. I was like, is this some kind of anarchist cookbook thing? I don't know. Uh, Kevin, you? And we didn't have tennis balls where I grew up, so yeah, we didn't play tennis balls. Let alone ones that explode. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, now, Johnny, uh, Hill Person Johnny is that other character you mentioned. He's been doing a lot of fun stuff, but you also just started a, a little bit of a, a journey of self-discovery, I see, everywhere uh, publicly. What's what's that all about? <laughs> I don't know if I'll say everywhere. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I got my medication. I've been sick for eight years. My medication got sorted out. And for the first time in eight years, I could eat anything I want. And so what did I do? I ate anything I wanted. Also, Little Caesars opened up here in my hometown and I ate it all. And so their stocks are going up with Little Caesars. And so I have gained 56 pounds in about a year and a half. And so beginning on June 1st, I decided, well, it, I was told to. Uh, I'm doing it publicly, and so I'm going on a very public journey not to lose weight. I'm going on a public journey to health, 
And I know I've got almost 300 people that have signed up to do this with me and we're doing it together. So there's a big group of people, hashtag hillbilly health. Some people are gaining weight. Some people are losing weight. Some people are maintaining. I got a lot of strong guys that want to get stronger. And there's a lot of uh, moms that just want to feel better for their kids. So it's about health. And I absolutely cannot believe this place that I found myself in, like me of all people, but I'm doing it and I feel great. All right. I love it. Uh, 22 Cheapster in the YouTube chat said mortars, uh, I think referring to the tennis balls. I don't know anything about that. If they got to be homemade, my, 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 my presupposition, I'm not willing to Google it is I, I suppose somebody has made something with the tennis ball, but I don't want to know. Yeah. I don't want that in my search history. Nope. Kevin, what you've been up to, where can people find you? Um, well, first, let me say this, uh, Johnny, we, we need more and more of you, man. Um, you, you brought, you brought a lot of humor, a lot of needed relief to such a serious industry, dude. It was, it was good to see you kind of come out of nowhere. Uh, so keep, keep the fire, brother. Keep the fire. It's, it's good stuff. Thanks, um, Kevin. That's in my heart, man. It uh, makes me feel good. Not a problem, man. You're well, well deserved. Um, okay, sweetheart. Give me one minute. Um, same thing for we like shooting. I, I tell these guys too. It's it's nice to be somewhere where everybody's casual. It's not so. Uh, I don't know, man. It just doesn't feel so. You have to. I don't. I like not having to to feel like everybody's just being tough. I like feeling like I'm talking to my neighbors, right? So, uh, and this this provides a platform. So, Sean, I appreciate you guys providing that kind of platform out there. Um, and me, it's uh, I'm just. Uh, you can you can keep up with what I have going on by following me on all the social medias. It's all the same, pretty much. NLC Firearms on YouTube is NLC Firearms Channel. On um, every other platform is NLC Firearms Training or a KD for Kevin Dixie of NLC or just simply my name, Kevin Dixie. You can find me on all your platforms. As far as things I have coming up, I'll be. Um, we just got done with the NLC Train and Learn event, and for anybody out there that is aspiring industry or industry, and Johnny, if you don't come to the next one, I'm going to give you 180 different ways to die. So. <laughs> Um, but that, that event was probably the, the, I think one of the best things I've done, and it was basically taking, um, having a seminar and a workshop to help people in our industry, no matter what you do to learn from others and be better at it. Right. So, um, I think that that was awesome. You know, we had, we oversold the event. It was, uh, started at 15 people and it, it, it grew to, well, almost, well, we had over 60 people on site. Um, so that was really good. And all people that want to learn and do better and be better presenters of information. So, you know, my, my thing with that event was if I can pull people in a room and help you understand your business, your brand, how to run a business from behind the scenes, not from me, but from guys that are smarter than me, if we can get you all in that room and, and kind of guide you and make you better, the stronger you are in the people you influence are, then the stronger we all are. So to have an industry event, this, that was, that was pretty cool, man. I was really, really humbled by that. And then to have the ultimate happen that we had one of the students um, uh, immediately go home and have to use that to defend his family was was uh, sad, but great at the same time. Um, after that, um, let's see, I got uh, some stuff going on with uh, Lucid Optics and Outdoor Channel coming up here in uh, about a week and a half, two weeks. I'll be going out to Wyoming and having some fun out there. So I'll pretty much be the only black dude in the middle of Wyoming in a place that you got to get off a plane and drive two and a half hours. So, hey, we'll see how that works out. Um, that Kevin, if you need some help and how to access white culture, if you need mm -hmm. some help, just let me know because I can teach you some phrases and you're going to be a good old boy before it's over. Okay. You know, I might, I might hit you up on that, John. Let's start hey. with by God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so after that, um, I'll be going, um, I have a, a training coming up here in the uh, middle, uh, middle of July here in Missouri, uh, kind of a BOGO, my, my give back to the community is basically two days of training for 200 bucks. Um, hope everybody come out to that. Check out my channel for that stuff. Um, and then in August, I'll be going out to uh, speak, believe it or not, to politicians, educators, um, council people, which are politicians and law enforcement in California. I'm getting um, going out there to speak at a big seminar in Carson, California, hosted by a guy named Ryan Tillman with uh, an event called Hashtag It's Needed. And it's all of us coming together to figure out how we can better community. So we get to all have a conversation. So that's going to be exciting. I got some of the world's greatest uh, public speakers actually that are going to be there, guys that charge like 50 grand a day to speak. And I get to share the stage with them. So that's going to be exciting. Um, after that, man, I'll be uh, speaking at GRPC, a couple other um, openings for gun ranges around, uh, two of them in the country anyway. So just a lot of stuff. Just watch all the social medias. I, I stay pretty busy. I try to stay pretty active and uh, keep up. Oh, and be on the lookout for Aiming for the Truth. And aiming, go fund me forward slash aiming for the truth. Look it up. You can learn all about it. It'd be a great something for you to get behind and help out with.
Yeah. Uh, you guys sound like you're doing a lot of cool stuff and I'm over here like, yeah, I might have Taco Bell for dinner. I don't know. Oh, uh, because you only, you only interview some of the coolest people around and get to network with everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Humble. He's, he's really <laughs> humble. Oh, you guys sound like it's so much fun. I'm like, yeah, I'm doing, yeah, I'm cool stuff. Also. I, I also do that. Anyway. Uh, thank you so much, guys. I appreciate you both very much. I uh, consider you both friends and really appreciate you spending this time with me this week. Uh, I can't say thank you enough to the listeners who are out there. We appreciate you guys as well. And don't forget, This Week in Guns is produced by Kenny Ortega and is a production of the Firearms Net Radio Network. And Kevin, uh, if it comes down to it while you're in Wyoming, just don't forget, drop the shoulder, do a shoulder roll, and my friend, come up with a knife. 